what I'll do now is, is go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, first of all, I'll go ahead and introduce Umberto. And, uh, you know, he is, uh, has a doctorate degree um, with a, uh, in electrical and computer engineering with a minor in mechanical engineering. So I, Umberto, I don't understand. How can you get a minor in mechanical engineering and still do electrical engineering? It sounds like you were a glutton for punishment there. <laughs> I, actually, uh, and I got the funding from uh, the nuclear engineering department. So oh. I was engaged right from the beginning in, in a very multidisciplinary uh, education. So. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> okay, well, so let's see, we are having a little bit of feedback now. Let me just mute some microphones here as we go. Um, okay, so if, if I've muted your microphone, feel free to unmute, um, unmute your microphone. Uh, just by selecting the button over to the right, the red button, you can unmute it. Um, so let me go ahead and just continue with Umberto's uh, introduction. You know, Umberto's worked for Argonne and also INL, and he's also the right now the group lead for the Dynamic Systems Integration Optimization Resilient Controls. Um, and, uh, you know, I've just got to say I, I went to a, a conference there at Idaho National Labs or near there, and, and uh, we're very impressed by Umberto and his group and the things that he's working on. Okay, so let me let me switch over to, to Richard. Richard is on as well as, uh, and you know he had a uh, has a doctorate degree from uh, BYU in chemical engineering, and he worked for Exxon. Um, I, I worked for Exxon too, Richard. So we have something in common there. Uh, and then joined Idaho National Labs in in 1990. You know, the thing I'll say about Richard is, is he thinks big and the projects that he proposes and things that he works on are, uh, have a, a big impact. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so I'm pleased to have, uh, Richard Umberto here. Well, let me just, uh, start uh, the, uh, this webinar by, uh, first thanking the American Institute of uh, Chemical Engineers and in particular John for the, the opportunity, uh, to brief you, all you guys, in some of the activities that we're doing here at ANL. As you know, uh, Richard is he's, uh, he's a co-author of these presentations. And uh, also we have here uh, Dr. Wembo Du, who is, uh, is just graduated from uh, University of Michigan. And uh, he's uh, one of our uh, optimization expert. This effort also is in collaboration uh, with uh, Professor Chris Paredes at Georgia Tech. And uh, he's a student uh, Bill Binder. A few things uh, you will see in this presentation is uh, key, uh, key notions are systems. Uh, we are interested in looking at the process and uh, or technology solution from the system point of view. Also, not only for doing modeling simulation, but also hiring the loop. And other key words is optimizations, and another one is controls. We are interested in, rather than power grids or smart power grids, more into uh, energy grid, in which you have uh, several community besides electricity. And the key thing you will see there here is that uh, the challenges are such that require innovation not only in modeling and simulation, but also in control and optimization and integration of those technology. Because the uh, spectrum of the uh, challenges are so wide, requires quite a bit of collaboration, and that's the kind of consortium we're trying to put to bring it together not only national labs, but also uh, university and the uh, finally it's hard in the loop in demonstration because as we understand the system better and better we want to be able to uh, simulate the in, in more realistic environment. Okay, the uh, outline is uh, so a very brief uh, motivation of what we're doing here, in particular in the energy systems, then uh, the concept of hybrid energy systems. Then some of the modeling issues, a challenge that we have uh, uh, facing and uh, tackling. Then uh, uh, issues regarding the cost simulation, in which you might have a number of models or, or physical assets all talking together coordinatedly. Then the issue regarding optimization, because at the end we try to optimize the system not only in the uh, design of the system, what kind of energy resources are needed, but also in how to operate the system. And then uh, the last three ones give some uh, few results. Some of those, uh, um, some of those results you can find it, you know, uh, publications out there. And then I conclude with the uh, uh, the conclusions of future work. 
And please, as Joe indicated, yeah, interrupt me anytime you might have a question. So the key part here is, uh, well, we have all kinds of different energy resources, and uh, not only source of energy, but also uh, energy communities, commodities. Mm -hmm. So then we have the uh, traditional energy, coal, gas, and uh, nuclear. And now we have these new elements, this called uh, uh, renewable energy. And so we have wind, uh, uh, hydro, uh, we have solar, so forth. Uh, to deal with the availability of renewable, then uh, uh, there is need for some kind of energy storage, and that might be electrical or could be thermal, and many other ones. And then again, is uh, uh, we have uh, we utilize energy to create different commodities. It could be electricity or it could be synthetic fuel. And the question is, is uh, uh, what will be uh, uh, the optimal uh, combination of these resources to meet certain requirements on this certain constraint? And again, I'm going to go very fast for these introductory slides. Then, uh, uh, so if we look at uh, the, uh, uh, the grid, so we have uh, uh, all different resources interconnected by electrical grid. And in traditional, we have these uh, generation plants, so, so that you see there on the top uh, left. Then, uh, uh, and then we have the load to utilize the, the, the energy. This generation normally a nuclear, uh, coal plant, natural gas, so forth. And then uh, what is coming into uh, this picture to deal uh, with our ability now that it's coming uh, with renewable is the uh, intent of maybe use some uh, level of storage there. Again, it could be electrical storage, it could be uh, thermal storage, it could be things like a pump hydro and so forth. And the new element that is coming also to the which we are working in is what we call high rating system. And high rating system are systems that now kindly couple different resources with intent of uh, trying to uh, minimize the uh, effects of the availability into so of renewable and be able to still utilize the uh, our, uh, existing infrastructure. So then, uh, uh, in, in that in, in that way, the hybrid system then, even though it might have seen as a dispatchable source of electricity to the grid, but at the same point, it produce, uh, might produce also other products when there is uh, excess of energy, and this product may be chemicals, hydrogen, water, and so forth. And as we go through the presentation, you will see a little more details that might be inside of that box, hybrid system. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's a, a, a big picture, uh, uh, the motivation that why we're working on this, and then let me, uh, let's go into the uh, hiring system. So hiring system, you see there, um, one might say uh, is constituted by uh, five different elements. So you have the generation of energy, and those ones, if you see to uh, the left, my be constituted by uh, base uh, loads uh, uh, energy sources, and you have there the uh, gas turbine, coal, uh, but then also uh, because of the sizing, a uh, small motor reactor on, on the generation. On the generation, so two, if you see to uh, the top uh, right, you see then uh, 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 renewable, and renewable again could become as a form of wind, solar, and many other ones. Anyway, then uh, obviously we generate that energy is because there is some consumer of it. So the second element there you see on the bottom are the loads. And the loads, uh, 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 it can take the energy either uh, as a thermal energy coming in or as electrical energy coming to the right, as you see there. Eventually to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to connect those two worlds, so we have a third element that is the distribution, the distribution that allows us to again take energy generated at the generation and put it into the load. Okay. Then uh, the uh, the four element uh, was mentioning is to deal with some this level this variability that the system the, this uh, uh, energy sources uh, introduced into the system, we might have some level of storage there, and that storage could be thermal storage, or it could be also electrical storage. Uh, finally, as you see, you create a very uh, uh, Entirely coupled system, and then uh, for, for uh, connecting them and making them uh, to operate in a cohesive ma manner, so that we have the integrations. And the integration makes sure that it uh, has variability introduced by the uh, renewable generation changes and variability introduced by the loads. The integration control, monitoring controls, uh, 
the function is to modulate, modulate the thermal energy here and this electrical energy here, energy here to uh, improve efficiency of the system, resiliency of the system, and many other attributes. So this is like a, a hybrid car, but a much, much bigger s scale, you might say. Well, here is just to give an example of how one of, one of those particular uh, hybrid systems might look like. Well, here you have, again, a generation, the base load, a small model reactor, uh, producing out thermal energy there. And in a classical approach, you will have that energy going to the power generation, whatever that is, to be a very tune cycle so forth, and eventually feeds the electrical grid. But if we introduce now uh, the second element, the wind, introduce viability. So if one for a, if for once we assume that the electrical load is requirement is a flat one, so when this one comes in line, so there is an excess of energy then. So you can manage the excess energy either by utilizing, as I was saying, a, a some element of storage in this case, uh, uh, batteries, or by redirecting or repurposing this energy that you, the thermal and the electrical one, and to do something else there. The benefit of doing such an approach is you create a, 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 an extra a freedom there in how to manage energy generation and utilization. So again, some of the challenging is how you do that in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a dynamic matter, how you actually devise the storage in a thermal electrical how you best maximize the capital, and then how eventually put all together by monitoring control uh, uh, strategies. Okay, so then and now we're going to the modeling. As I was saying, there is require a lot of innovation in all the aspects, modeling, simulation, optimization, and control. So let's check out some of the things uh, on the modeling, uh, on the modeling uh, uh, portion. The approach that we have here at INL uh, in tackling a hybrid system is to uh, doing a graded approach in which Given a region, for example, let's assume that we have uh, the western, uh, we have Wyoming. Wyoming has some needs on uh, utilize, uh, better utilizing the uh, energy resources, let's say coal, natural gas, or, and also renewable, let's say wind. So we look into the area and do uh, a global analysis of what kind of energy system might make more sense there, given the, those resources. Given that, then we go to a, a level more detail in which we do uh, 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 process modeling. And in, in this case, is we're trying to see uh, does it make economic sense of what we're putting together, and also what kind of size we're talking about here? What size of the uh, small water reactor? What size of the chemical plant? So forth. And this analysis is mostly done on the steady state of some sort of that uh, using tools like uh, Aspen and so forth. But eventually, when we have uh, reduced the number of candidates, then we go to doing the dynamic analysis of the system. How those different components we put together and how they can be better integrated and controlled to be able to uh, uh, address the variability on the regeneration and also on the uh, consume, uh, consumption of that energy. And eventually as we do that, then we push it then uh, to even further into doing hybrid in the loop uh, uh, demonstration in order to minimize the risk of deployment of these quite advanced energy solutions. Again, I'm going very fast on this introductory. So then, uh, uh, so in, in also in doing the modeling of the system, one might think uh, uh, the first one is doing what is called causal modeling. It's what the one that we most familiar to it. A causal modeling is those one where you already define essentially what is input to the system, what is output to the system, and then you write the uh, 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 corresponding uh, uh, governing equation that uh, do, deals with this energy flow. And then here is an example of, for example, a cost of modeling in which we have what is input, the electricity, we have what is the output, in this case, the mass of helium that a nuclear reactor generates, both to feed a, a power system, but also to feed, let's say, a chemical plant. Okay. But the thing here is in cost of modeling, again, you know what is your input to the system, you know what is the output to the system. So in a way, it restricts the, uh, the possibility of uh, the experiment. you want, once want to have a more open uh, kind of structure that allows you to ask many what if questions and also allows you the reusability of uh, models because you don't want to specify what input output. 
So then uh, we have, then now we're going to a causal modeling. And uh, here is, for example, uh, a very simplistic uh, model of a nuclear reactor. In which is Umberto, could you uh, maybe go back to that last slide? I just had a question about that one. Um, so I, I'm trying to understand this, this block diagram here. And so are you proposing that electricity comes in and then uh, helium is, is then fed to the process? I, I'm not quite understanding. Well, these, yeah. uh, by the way, you will see the uh, uh, this particular uh, block diagram in, in within a bigger con uh, context, so you know what the reactor is doing here. The important thing from this uh, of this diagram is that you have here transfer functions, yeah, the plasma okay. fun transfer function of the system. I think the important message here is you define what is the input to the system and define what is the output of the system. So. Information flow goes this way from the left to the right. Okay. And so this is this is the multi-scale modeling that you proposed in your last slide, where this is the lowest level of the dynamic models, but you also have very uh, you know larger grid-scale steady-state models as well. Yeah, but also it's what we are um, uh, classically has been used all the time. We have causal modeling because at the end, if you use Fortran or if you use uh, MATLAB, whatever that is, all those instructions there they are causal uh, instruction there. You know what is the input, you know okay. what is the output. But then, like I say, force you that. But uh, but in a causal model, you actually do truly equality of the phenomenon you're trying to describe. And let the system to resolve it depending on where this particular model is being introduced. And, and John, to answer your question specifically, you're just seeing a snapshot of an element in that larger model. This is a high temperature gas cooled reactor which is basically cooled by helium, and then that helium you see in those transfer functions is either going to a Brayton cycle to produce power, and, and the power is going into something called high temperature steam electrolysis to produce hydrogen. But he's just simply showing you a breakdown of one of the elements that uh, captures the high temperature gas reactor, which produces hot helium. Okay, got it. And also the uh, signal based nature of the representation of the physics there. Yeah. Here you have, you say, helium going to the high temperature steam electrolysis and helium going to the uh, power generation through a Brayton cycle. Mm -hmm. Now, in this one, see, a pass is what is being called, well, called signal based kind of thing. Great for doing controls, things like that. But actually, it, it doesn't really reflect the physics that really is occurring there because it's forcing the model to resolve the equations. So here, for example, we have a model of uh, a nuclear reactor. In this case, very simplistic. It's just, uh, uh, you know, here is a, uh, some kind of fluid that comes in. It's been heated up by this source of heat, and it comes out in a given uh, uh, conditions there. So to describe this system here, then we have uh, the heat source. Uh, here we have, uh, uh, you know, in a way, the energy balance of it, you know, uh, thermal energy coming in, thermal energy coming out. Then over here that we have a, a, a description of the flow within this boiler. Then over here we have a description of uh, here the convention is any 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 uh, uh, energy or, or, or any flow is assumed positive when it's coming to the model. So then we have the mass of uh, uh, of fluid coming in into the boiler and the mass uh, this uh, flow coming into the boiler here. So we have a mass balance. And finally, also, we have an energy imbalance around the system here. As you see, the entropy coming in plus the one that comes in equals the one out there. Now, what is important here in this equation is all these ones are truly inequality. You don't really say what is the input and output. So it might be that the flow goes this way one, um, at one point, but something changes, pressure, uh, differentials, whatever it is, that there may be, there will be, uh, maybe the flow changes and go this way, reverse of that. Well, from a modeling perspective, this is really what describes the physics, this equality. And, and let the uh, computer system to resolve that, whether it's the flow is going this way or whether the flow is going that way, depending on particular condition of the system. Okay, so in doing that, so in, in, uh, in as we pro, uh, progress in the study of having a system, we recognize that, uh, that we needed to have this requirement in whatever model, uh, whatever modeling uh, framework we we're going to utilize it. We wanted to have a causal, and I hear, uh, and, uh, or the, what is called declarative uh, uh, kind of uh, modeling language that allow us to solve problems of any structure without we priorly defining what are the inputs and outputs.
Like I say, I can go for, uh, we can go forever in describing that, but that is one of the uh, uh, requirements that we're looking for. Then it needs to be multi-domain, you will see very, well, you actually are seen in there, no? Uh, we don't just worry about, for example, electrical system, we won't worry about chemical system, we worry about mechanical system, we don't worry about thermal system. So there has to be an uh, environment that is amenable to uh, allow to integrate all these different uh, uh, disciplines. We want to have it also be open there, to allow uh, the collaboration between different institutions and organizations and so forth. Because for example, let's assume, okay, Aspen is very good, but then if you are sharing models with another institution, with another institution will have to have Aspen. We're trying to try to do the most in the open environments so everybody can have access to that. And finally, it needs to be able to, obviously, for this particular one is, all the analysis that we're interested in, too, at least at this point, is uh, the dynamic aspect of that. And it's dynamic in only how to operate it, but also in doing the economic analysis and so forth. And hybrid here, that means hybrid from the point of view, not on the energy, but uh, in the sense that uh, it has time-driven dynamics, like uh, we are used to in most physical processes, but also have event-driven dynamics. It's when you have supervisory control or sitting the react to events rather than time. And finally, part of the open, no proprietary, so we'll ease the collaboration. Uh, so for those particular models, when we select modelic as, as, as such. Okay, and there are many other ones. Now, the co-simulation portion of that, it indicates that, again, they know that we, everyone will have a, a particular tool they want to utilize, Aspen, MATLAB, uh, 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 the, uh, DICE, or so many other ones. And we need to be able to uh, uh, be able to co-simulate all that, uh, able to put all those models and uh, sometimes as it together in a co-simulation, so then uh, to be able to emulate a much bigger system. And then, uh, and so for that, uh, we are developing either the tools or your asset tool already existing. And here is an example in which you have uh, a model written in Simulink and uh, uh, developed by NREL, and then uh, we have models developing in, uh, well, as I mentioned, model, like model, and how you put those things together, and for example, for that, we're using this uh, uh, co-simulation tool, uh, be developed by, you know, by Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, but also uh, running over uh, uh, Pathomy, which is was developed in the University of uh, uh, California, Berkeley, it's called BCTV, uh, BCV TV, which is time building control virtual test beds, uh, uh, test bed. So this kind of tool allows us to take models written in one environment to models written in another environment and run all together as a, a, and a much large emulation. And uh, here is how you would do it for that particular tools. We are developing all the tools to be able to connect, for example, models Re, uh, running in, uh, in a certain operating system with models running, for example, on uh, real-time detail, detail simulation. The intent is that eventually when you're trying to emulate this very large system, then we'll be in the need of doing some kind of co-simulation and eventually going to hurry in the loop. And this is just a more descriptive of how you would do that on this particular tool. But as I, as I was saying, what we intend, as we understand the system better and better, we want to utilize the uh, unique physical assets that we have at the national labs and creating what is called hardware in the loop uh, demonstration. And in this particular one, what you can see here, for example, is uh, that, for example, you might have models of these different components, a model of the nuclear reactor, a model of uh, the turbine, and so forth, and, uh, and you feel com comfortable that the level of granularity of this model is sufficient and accurate enough to do the analysis. But then you want to have uh, uh, the connection between them, uh, the thermal loop that it says, okay, how much of that, ther see this, the energy is generated by, for example, nuclear, and it's distributed either this way or either that way. And we have determined that uh, that modulation or distribution of thermal energy is such that we need to have actually physical hardware connecting to that. So that's, uh, uh, we, we connect the system, physical assets and models all together in a, in a, in a con, uh, simulation. So for, then uh, the final uh, issue is optimization. Again, uh, we have to, uh, we're doing in how to optimize the systems when you design the system uh, or the same point uh, when you operate it there. So the challenge here is you really have a, a multi-loop uh, uh, problem here in which Initially, you have to uh, uh, figure out what are the best configuration, given the requirements and constraints. 
Then after you do that, is uh, uh, what are the size of uh, each of these components to meet whatever uh, needs? I mean, do I need a big battery? Do I need a small battery? Do I need how much of the, how much thermal uh, how much thermal storage is needed? How much electrical storage? And eventually also set uh, 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 the control strategy. So it's a, a loop. It's a loop within a loop within a loop. Of optimization is happening there, and ones need to be taken care of that. You will see some example there. The, one of the key notions here is what we call, what is being called real options, and the intent is there is a uh, is design system that uh, don't have a life of let's say just 20 years, but have a life of many years that uh, is uh, able to uh, 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 introduce new technologies as they become available. Because, for example, hard energy system might start using a, as a, a base load generation natural gas, but naturally, but naturally and uh, and easily transform into, for example, a nuclear reactor. Yeah. This is the uh, uh, well. This is the big picture. This is what we're working right now. You will see some of the result. In which then uh, uh, the optimization started by saying, okay, uh, are we going to use a traditional one in which essentially is one generation, one load, or use an advanced, which is a heavy energy system, depending on the requirement. Given that, then I would say, okay, now let's select the technology there. Let's do the optimization of the technology. What will be the base load? It should be a, nuclear, a natural gas, a nuclear reactor, or a renewable, wind or solar, depending on the location. Storage. Thermo electrical and the power cycle. It should be a Rankine cycle or a Brayton cycle. Then you go on the next step lower in the sizing. So or, or, or the size of each component. How fast the component needs to do? What kind of efficiency is needed? Are we okay with the uh, a molten salt a heat exchanger or a, a, a water based uh, heat exchanger and the cost associated? And eventually then you go even further is in the operation of the system. And again, you will see some example on some of those components being optimized. All right, so then, uh, 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 okay, so then I'm going to, uh, uh, we're going to provide a few uh, results uh, in, all, in all two different uh, portions of that. Okay, perfect. So the, the, the first one we look, uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to uh, we're going to show you some of the uh, uh, efforts that we use using Casper models on some of the dynamic analysis on it. And on this one, okay, so here is uh, we took uh, the reason we took this hybrid system in particular is because we did some analysis and, and show some promising here. And how does it work? Well, we have a pre primary heat generation in this case, a small reactor generates steam at a certain temperature uh, and pressure. Then there is a steam to power generator that generates electricity, and here you have essentially the uh, classical way. One generation, uh, one consumer. But now let's we include these uh, new elements, renewable. Okay, so it comes in here. And if you assume that uh, this, uh, this requires a flat gener uh, load to here or generation, so when this guy comes in, which is uncontrollable and very variable, so we might need to have a storage here. Okay? Now, and, 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 uh, and another approach or um, uh, complementary approach is when this energy comes in here, we'll take the extra energy that is not required here anymore and send it down here to take uh, uh, the carbon uh, the carbon source coming from natural gas and transform that in some kind of the uh, chemical product, in this, in this case, gasoline. So what we did is we put uh, all this configuration uh, using a... a, a Actually, we use the configuration of both models, causal model, and a causal model for different uh, 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 intent. And, and you will see that uh, the best one to analyze the dynamic portion is using a causal model. Okay, so here's some of the uh, results to, uh, uh, that we have when we put that together. And again, it's because we want to see how changing different uh, dynamic properties of different components change the overall performance of the system. And here is one that indicates, for example, if you have the renewal penetration in here and you have the average generation deficit, meaning what, uh, the deficit is what the grid wants and what the hybrid system, uh, the difference between what the grid wants and what the hybrid energy they can actually deliver. So it shows that a uh, increase in there, as you see here, the deficit keeps reducing. 
right? And uh, here he's, uh, he's making a city slow to much faster and faster and faster. As the renewable increases, so the ones will require the uh, the low, the the, uh, the base load generation to have a better dynamic characteristic to be able to uh, 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 low follow the uh, the generation and the and the uh, the load. Here is a, for example how is a time series analysis in which here is what you want to generate, and if you make a, a low follow uh, uh, base generation fast enough, you can get very close to it. But as this guy becomes slower and slower, then there is more deficit in what you can accomplish. And that deficit, uh, uh, deficiency is increased with a uh, high level of renewable penetration, as we can expect. Here is something that is very intuitively too, also. It's indicated here. Here we have from no storage going this direction, more storage, more storage, more storage. So you see here that uh, has for example, for a particular renewable generation, as you increase the storage here, the deficiency decreases. And here is, for example, how you see it in time series. Here's what you want to generate. And here is uh, uh, with a lot of storage, less storage, and less storage. So you can see the, def the, the efficiency increases as the storage de de decreases. Here then again the uh, uh, the uh, I think the message of this is again here you renewable penetrations and uh, here is uh, what we call the normalized average return. This is just comparing of what is the benefit of high utilization uh, as opposed of just taking a single generation source to a single uh, community generation. And what the system shows all this analysis, by the way, was done in the dynamic context. Was this uh, plot shows that uh, when you achieve an uh, 18% renewable generation right here, then uh, uh, it is uh, uh, high utilization is favor. Even though you, uh, uh, here's compared by the way, a national gas with a nuclear. So even though using a high capital asset as a nuclear reactor as a young base load, this plot says that uh, even that point after 18%, it becomes uh, 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 economical to start using a nuclear reactor that uh, is pro providing both electricity and also a chemical uh, uh, product. Then now let's do and do some uh, dynamic analysis with a causal models. So then what we did one is uh, uh, what we did was then we took the uh, the uh, let me just go very quick. We took this one and make a much, much uh, refined or higher granularity model of it using equosal models. So the first thing we did is here is the here's the city, here's your reactor. This is the first path. And from this point, it's going to the electrical grid. And, and here you have the renewable and so forth. So normally you go this way. And now we have this secondary path in which now the excess of energy uh, might go this way, you know, here, and eventually go this way, and eventually goes here, and eventually feeds a chemical plant. Okay? So now you see here is a very detailed model in which now you have not only the nuclear reactor, but you have pipes, you have uh, heat exchanger, condenser, turbines, the whole thing there. Well, low, low complexity, and then you have to model the system, and also the same uh, point do the controls to be able to operate it. So the, what we did is we, did, we pull this model first in Aspen just to do the sizing of the equipment. And after we have this sizing of the equipment, then we move into the Modelica regime. And here is the model uh, written now on the Modelica framework using Daimola as uh, the, uh, the tool on doing just that. So in doing that, so here you here you, here you have again a reactor. Then it's a subsystem and subsystem here uh, and modulate essentially either uh, some of that goes to electrical, some of this energy goes to uh, electricity production, or some of that one eventually fits and is used for a, a, a chemical production. And in doing this model, then we uh, uh, construct a lot of different sub models of different components the headers, the mixers, accumulators, and so forth. And the exciting part of all those things is that all these ones, again, were a causal model. So allow us to easily reuse those models in many other configurations without constraining ourselves in the particular configuration that we eventually will use. 
All right, so then, uh, uh, so just uh, uh, briefly, again, is uh, uh, here is the model of the reactor. In this case, it was very simplistic. We have a much, much detailed one of it, but just for the presentation here to show you, it's essentially a, energy, uh, a heat source that heats uh, 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 water coming in in this fashion. And, and if you see it here, it's essentially uh, is assuming that the reactor is set up in a certain operating, uh, operating condition, and then it just go and hit it there. Here is the, uh, uh, similar to this one. The only difference here is allows them now to low follow the reactor, depending how it changes on the generation, on the renewable, and changes on the markets there on the other side and see the benefits of low following at the, at the generation side to meet, uh, to meet the uh, uh, electrical demands or the chemical demand, whatever that is. Here is going then further on into the model. And here you see here will be the reactor. Here is whatever is producing is going to the grid. Here is where whatever is producing is going to the chemical plant. And if you go here, then you here you, have, uh, uh, you see the different components, the line, the turbines, generators, then eventually the condenser here is, uh, as you spin the, uh, the shaft here, you, you, you create a, a, a rotational, uh, uh, a rotational uh, mechanical ro rotation there that is eventually used to uh, generate electricity there. Then uh, uh, here then uh, you have the condensing coming back and going back to the reactor. But then as I say, some of the excess energy, depending on how, what is happening here, can be sent to the chemical plant and uh, all this equipment that I needed, boiler, he heaters, and so forth. Here is all the uh, all the different models that we put it together and developed just to do essentially the uh, headers. And what this guy does is eventually, here is the energy coming from the reactor. Here the energy is, is going to the chemical plants. And what this all this thing is doing is trying to maintain a constant uh, energy supply to the chemical plants. So we run the chemical plant in some sort of steady state kind of thing. This portion here is essentially a utility boiler that allows to compensate for changes on a steam coming from the nuclear reactor because the energy of the reactor is sent, be sent to uh, electrical generation. And then here is then now the chemical portion of the system in which you have the different component. Again, uh, for this particular analysis, we were taking natural gas and converting that into uh, uh, gasoline in here. And then you have the different uh, uh, main elements, reform, synthesis, and purity. One of the key portions that we did here was, again, all this one was uh, bottled in detail using Aspen. And eventually, taking those models, we uh, compute and reduce our models to be able to uh, in, uh, include in, in this particular one. One more thing you notice also is uh, uh, the Aspen model with steady state, and then we add the dynamic to them, uh, and when we integrate it in here. And so, a question about this. Um, you did some uh, insight in uh, the deviations you saw between the reduced order model and the detail model. I couldn't hear well, or oh, we couldn't. Can you say that again? Um, what are the differences you observe between the re reduced order model and the detailed model? Yeah, yeah, well, this one, each of this one, very, it was very, very, very complex, and, and because of the complexity of that, if we would have put those models there in the main uh, uh, simulation, they would have a very long uh, time to be able to converge to anything. So what we did was uh, uh, we took the, uh, the these very uh, detailed models of each of these elements and excited them. Saying, okay, how it would change with this kind of signal? How it would change? So we eventually, given those one, we were able to simplify that on the first order uh, differential equation. Uh, uh, essentially, defining what it is the the gain on this process, and then what is the time constant of this process. Same for this, and same for that. Now we are working in a more uh, a more uh, analytical way on on resolving this problem, and this is an ongoing effort. But essentially, that's the way how these reduce all the models. Okay, so the, here is uh, uh, 
uh, because of the time, I wanted to keep going. Uh, the internal is a slide I wanted to show. You know, the uh, the very now uh, complex uh, uh, system one is creating, it provides a lot of benefit to it, but it requires also to do the analysis of in the, in the uh, dynamic. How the system is ramped up and how once wool will shut down. The internal is started to show that a, a dynamic model is needed to be able to understand if I lose in a sink and hit sink or or I actually or, or, or new rule or renewal come in, once need to analyze that problem in the dynamic setting to be able to uh, to see what the sitting is able to react to those changes and if it's not, what kind of uh, mitigation can be put there to accommodate that. Here, for example, uh, here we, we see uh, how, for example, here are the different turbines. If you want to notice, there were a set of three turbines of different size. And here it shows you how the different turbines, uh, 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 the flow going to those turbines changes depending on how the wind is changing in a, in, in a given period there. So you see, there's a lot of uh, issues there. This is another example here that I can go later on in the time is, here it shows that, uh, for example, if uh, the particular model that we put there didn't have precise uh, a battery there. So it shows that uh, in this period of time, with this form of wind profile, uh, here we will have no enough power for the system to maintain operation there. So then uh, uh, things like this is that you can only see it really when you do a dynamic uh, model simulation of the particular uh, hybrid system. Then here is the, the, the control in the pump. The, the essentially here you see is the, uh, the reason that you have, here you have the primary pump going up and down, and this one, almost the reverse of the other one, is because, again, you have one loop that is sending uh, a, a flow into uh, for electrical production, another one is sending for, th for uh, chemical, and they all essentially have to compensate with each other, all right? Because with the assumption here the reactor is running uh, 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 at the same uh, at the same power level. And finally, uh, here's what is happening: the chemical one, the same thing, steam coming from the reactor, uh, steam coming from the reactor, and it's compensated for the steam from the utility. And at the end, what we want is a constant operation of the chemical plant. Finally, uh, uh, let me go then uh, on the optimization uh, study. So again, uh, so you uh, you have you analyze the system, it works, and now you want to optimize in the design both in what are the particular configuration that you have, the sizing of the element, the things like that, and eventually how to operate it. Okay, so then in this particular case, we took this one. This is another hybrid system, and you see a nuclear reactor. Who's helium? Hey, John, this is the one you were asking before, and let me just go into that. But essentially, you have a high temperature gas reactor, produce helium, it goes to a very temporal plant, electricity, and then to the grid. And now it is complicated by adding a, 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 a renewable source, in this case wind, and then we know that some element of storage is needed. We want to, in many ways, actually even uh, minimize that. Okay. But then we recognize that if there is a lot of variability here, a lot of variability here, then, well, you may have, a, you may need a, a, a big uh, uh, storage there. Or be able to modulate the electricity distribution, and modulate the healing distribution, and utilizing when there is excess coming from this one in run the high temperature stream electrolysis right there. So that's what you saw, uh, John, on the uh, block diagram. The nuclear reactor is generating helium that is being used for power generation, but also helium that is being used for uh, chemical production, in this case, hydrogen and, and oxygen, right? Okay. Now, yeah, that makes a lot more sense. Before, I'd seen electricity coming in and helium coming out, but I hadn't noticed the... Uh, additional heat that was coming in from the bottom of that block. So that makes a lot more sense now that you have uh, the full block diagram. And by the way, and that, the electricity coming in here, you saw here, is actually information that you, you see here. You see there, the electricity coming in. It's really a set point telling the high temperature reactor really how much electricity is needed, or how, really how much helium is needed because of what is changing in here and what it might be changing here too. So that's, you, you see here, see, this is the information flow coming here and telling the reactor, hey, here is my demand in electricity. Oh, uh, this is my demand in helium for you. And then the reactor accordingly react to that and generate the helium. Then eventually you see here, by the way, sorry. Here is the block, here is the model, 
written in uh, in the molar and uh, molar liquor. So here's uh, the high temperature reactor. Here is the helium distribution it, it, and it's being modulated. Then it, the helium is used either for power generation, but I remember here you have electrons, electrons here, but this is modulated at the same point that either it goes to the grid or it goes to feed the uh, high temperature lithium electrolysis. And there you have. So this is the model on Reno uh, on Modelica. Now, one interesting part of here, by the way, here's some particular. But uh, one of the key th reasons I use uh, this is because, in essentially, it is a chemical plant that can nicely fast react to changes. Because most of his uh, inertia comes from electricity. There, it's not really thermal. Look the ratio between electricity and uh, and and thermal thing. So because it's mostly driven by electricity, this guy can react quite nicely and fast given the, the change of electricity. Anyway, so the question that we're having here is, okay, now let's assume that uh, uh, we want to design the reactor here and design this one and design this one, and we want to see how fast the dynamic needs to be to accomplish certain requirements on the certain constraint. Well, then uh, what we did, we put this configuration, this framework, in which, so essentially it was an optimization problem, right? So the, the, so in doing that is, okay, given that somebody provide an a higher energy system model or, or, or configurations, what are the values of these time uh, uh, constants that are needed there? So the problem comes in here is say, okay, is there is the particular set of uh, value uh, media optimization that we want to certify? If it's no, then we upgrade iterations, then we send that to the model, run the model, see how the model responds, and then we check some metrics. Uh, we achieve the the, uh, uh, the cost function. Uh, we minimize and uh, uh, we optimize the, cons the loss function. We're trying to uh, optimize. If the asking yes, is uh, we done. If not, we can do it. I think one important part here is also to show the different tools that are required here. Tools, for example, here is where your models actually live. In this case, it's a model modelica. Here is where your optimization algorithm will live. In this case, we were using MATLAB and a series of uh, 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 algorithms we have developed in collaboration with our university. And then you need something to connect these two worlds, the world of MATLAB to the world of the MOLA, and this way we use the uh, FMI, which is a, a, it's a time getting more and more and more relevant in here. Again, remember that what this block does is trying to figure out what is the optimal value for the uh, time constant for the battery, the high temperature gas reactor, and the breakdown cycle. And with given a minimum, maximum defined by the particular technology limitation that the system uh, can provide. Okay, so here's the uh, the, uh, 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 the loss function we're trying to, uh, uh, well, actually, this is the optimization problem that we're trying to uh, achieve, is minimize this loss function. So a so uh, a combination of both uh, uh, a, 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 a quality or inequality constraint there, as you see there, right? And in the particular one here, the loss function is given by this uh, uh, equation, and which th this one essentially says, hey, we want to minimize, we just want to minimize the variability of electricity uh, uh, going to the high temperature stream electrolysis. Because even though this particular chemical system can react nicely to changes, we want to minimize just that. Okay. Now we modify that one to inject the uh, 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 in one single equation the uh, uh, the constraints by this artificial in here that you have in here. Okay. So rather than uh, going to this one, we're going after this one and do the optimization of this one, which have both the initial loss function plus the constraint. Okay, so then, uh, 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 so in, in doing that, we say, okay, well, let's see how different values of uh, how of the uh, uh, the effect of the battery uh, does in, uh, in smoothing the signal going into electrical production, and uh, and what you see here, for example, that has here you have, for example, here is the battery, here is the uh, uh, renewable, and remember the uh, the battery what it's trying to do. Here is a smoother signal. So here you have, and here you have a very small battery that is have a very storage because the shedding area is how much energy is storaging. As you increase the size of the battery, so you require uh, okay the, the signal coming from the renewal is smooth uh, more, but then the shedding area requires okay now the type of the battery you have, and then here you have a. Uh, uh, one in which most smooth signal, 
but they require all this great area be storage by the battery. Okay, so increasing the battery in this direction. Okay, so then, okay, so recognize, yes, that the battery does have a good function there, but then let's see what is the optimal value of this particular dynamic uh, uh, setting. So w what we did is, okay, well, let's put that in an optimization uh, problem, and then it's trying to find the optimal values of the system, but then let's do it unconstrained. But what this plot shows in here is, here is the uh, optimization uh, iterations, and uh, here is uh, the values of each of these, uh, uh, the time constant for the battery, for the uh, high temperature gas reactor, and the rating. And what this one shows, they essentially all go to the uh, the uh, the limit. The battery goes it tends to go to the biggest battery he can go, and the Brayton the, uh, and uh, and the reactor to the fastest uh, dynamic they can go. So I mean, it's an obvious result. Is that optimal? Possibly not, and that's why you will see later on the constraint. By the way, here is uh, here, like I say, here is how you go in optimization, and here is how you uh, is the law function I, I just show you, show for a, a maximum value, and eventually goes, and this this is the best value you can get in uh, the variability on the uh, electricity going to the high temperature electrolysis. Okay, so the, the unconstrained is not exciting because it gets us to what we thought was obvious, which is again goes to the maximum into the battery and goes to the minimum into the high temperature gas reactor in the breakdown. Obviously, it goes by itself. They say, well, it is a way, a better optimal value, so then now we uh, have the constraint optimization result. And then now we put a discuss function here, in which now we uh, uh, weight the different, this depending on the technology. In this particular one, we were saying, hey, we put K2 actually four times more than this and this one to show we don't want too much variability in the high temperature gas reactor. Try to see whether that variability can be passed into the battery and the Brayton cycle. And here is is a, a is essentially bounding from the top and from the bottom the difference between the high temperature gas reactor and the Brayton cycle. Okay, so now the result is quite different now. So here is the optimization uh, pass, and then uh, here the uh, the values for the battery, the high temperature gas reaction, the Brayton cycle. And what it shows there, yes. The high temperature gas reactor goes to his maximum value, but now for the uh, the battery and the Brayton cycle, now it doesn't go here when it was before, but now some intermediate values there, and, and so that uh, that meets these constraints. And then as you see now, the uh, uh, here's the variability of high temperature gas react uh, of the uh, high temperature stream electrolysis, and uh, we optimize values of the uh, uh, for each of these elements. And okay, so then uh, here's the uh, again it, it, the constraint went to here's the summary. The constraint went to the maximum here, but now the constraint goes to a lower value to the the other one. And these ones before we're going to the minimum values, and now they get a value in between those two. Okay, and uh, here is the response of the high temperature steam electrolysis, the, the the wave of uh, 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 of the uh, 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 power going to the device. So you see how it changes on the constraint? Essentially what it changes is how the CT initially react uh, uh, when the whole process is put together and when the wind comes in and so forth. Okay, so finally uh, to end this uh, presentation then, uh, so then uh, I think it's, uh, it's obvious you see there the uh, there is a complex dynamics because uh, there is a transient behavior on all these different components, how the controller interacts, and then also uh, the variability introduced by renewable and the uncertainty associated with it. Then uh, when one do the kind of analysis, both to see the performance of the system, but also to do optimization and so forth, is the uh, quickly recognize, particularly because of the variability introduced by renewable and the demand, that they cannot be analyzed using steady state tools, just ask them. Tool can be a way to actually, uh, this kind of tool is a way to reduce the number of uh, candidates, but eventually we need a, a dynamic analysis of the system. So the, the uh, uh, so in the case here, so and then what we're doing now, so then uh, uh, co simulation is an important one, and, and recognizing that we have unique uh, physical assets here, 
then uh, uh, we're creating tools in and be able to do co-simulation between uh, uh, software and a specialized system like uh, the RTDS. Then we are the, uh, following making more details uh, implementations of uh, development of models of renewable. Uh, and this will be models, a course of models of wind and uh, or renewable and wind and solar. I think here we need a lot of help here. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the models that we have in chemical process models are steady state. Many of those one as and so forth. Be able to have dynamic models of chemical processing is key and, and, and a, a, an important one. And even more, it will be even nice to have a course of models, dynamic course of models of chemical processes. We have been developing uh, models of uh, small model reactors, and then uh, uh, that uh, can be used to predict anomal of and and, and, and all this, uh, another anomal situations. As I was saying, there uh, we're working on optimization techniques, tools, and technologies. Then uh, 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 developing a hardware capability, in which we'll be able to do this hardware in the loop simulation that uh, will provide more realistic uh, uh, analysis what we're doing. Then again, uh, monitoring control is key, and, and and be able to do predictive control is an important one, especially if one in, in put in the uh, re renewable generations. And then I do more detailed analysis on this kind of quite complex systems to be able to understand them better and to identify what are the, uh, te the technology uh, gaps that ones need to uh, be addressing. Like, uh, for example, do we need a di different type of uh, uh, heat exchanges that allow a more easy mo uh, modulization uh, or changes of thermal energy being generated? But with this, that ends my presentation.